This is a question I like to call the bow and arrow question. And I borrowed this question from the University of Waterloo Sir Isaac Newton physics contest. And it's a great question because it's set up without any numbers whatsoever, and yet you can still come up with a numerical answer, even though you're dealing with just some relationships to begin with. So it's a great lesson. Uh, the further you go in physics, the less and less you rely on numbers, and the more and more you rely on letters and expressions and learning how to manipulate them. So here's the question. Uh, we'll draw ourselves a, a sort of a bow and arrow here. So something that looks like this. And of course the bow would have a, a string attached at either end. I'll try and draw this as evenly as I can. And of course, uh, maybe in black here I'll put in the arrow. Now let's make sure we don't confuse this with actual forces on our diagram. This is a, a real life physical arrow as opposed to a force vector. So I'll put tail feathers on it so we don't confuse it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pull back on the arrow, which is how you work a bow and arrow. So this will be what we could call the applied force. Now of course when you pull back on an arrow, uh, you begin to create tension in the bowstring. And the harder you pull, the further back you stretch the bow, and the greater the tension becomes in the bowstring. So to help you all to visualize this, I'm also going to draw two arrows this way. There will be a tension created which is pulling this way in this string, and another tension here. Okay, These tensions, I'll call them F with a little t. A tension is really just a force that happens to be um, in a rope or a string or basically anything that's being sort of stretched. So I'll call it FT so we remember that it can be used as a force. It is a force. Now the interesting thing is because this is one single string that's being stretched, the tension that's created in the string is uh, on both sides of the string. It pulls with the same tension in both directions. And that's an important thing to realize. Tension always pulls in both directions. You can uh, visualize that. If you think about uh, standing here and pulling on a rope that you have tied to a tree, okay, if you are pulling this way with, say, 200 newtons, then you've created 200 newtons of tension in the rope and that 200 newtons of tension is pulling against you here, and it's also pulling this way against the tree. And uh, so tension is pulling with 200 newtons in both directions. So the same thing happens here when we pull back on the string. The tension is pulling with the same amount in both halves of the string. So let me erase this so that we don't get confused. Now I'm going to give you uh, a sort of a setup to the question. and. Um, if uh, the arrow is pulled back or drawn, if the arrow is pulled back until, remember we said the tension gets gradually larger as you pull. If the arrow is pulled back until the tension in the bowstring becomes equal to the force in which you are pulling, the applied force. The tension in the bowstring becomes equal to the applied force. What is the angle between the two halves of the bowstring? Put in a little bit more bowstring. 
So we have our green arrow showing the applied force, right? That's this right here, pulling back on the arrow. And we have our red arrow showing the tension. What I'll do in purple is I'll show you that um, we're looking for the angle between the two halves of the bowstring, which is the angle from here to here. Now, in the picture, it looks like 90 degrees. And you'd say, oh, it's going to be 90. But you can never rely on a picture you've just drawn. That's a sketch, uh, and there's nothing that indicates that that is an accurate representation of what's going on. We have to look at the forces and decide. And that's the cool part of this question. So what I'll do is um, I will take this picture, and uh, maybe I will uh, copy it and paste it. Just give, and I'll cut the time here just for a second. OK, so I copied the picture and pasted it. It made it a little bit bigger so we could work on it. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to erase this little purple line for now. We know that's the angle that we want to find eventually, but we're going to break this up a little bit. So let's go back to uh, our original picture without that purple air, uh, angle in there. OK, remember that when we solve physics problems, we always consider the forces that are acting vertically and the forces that are acting horizontally, kind of separately. And so we have a green applied force that is acting horizontally. Okay. Um, and we have two red forces, two tensions, which are not either completely vertical or completely horizontal. So the first thing we need to do is we need to resolve them into their vertical and horizontal components. How much of them is upy-downy and how much of them is lefty-righty? And there are two triangles because there are two halves of the strength, each pulling with its own tension. And now we're going to look at the angle that's formed here and here. We're going to call this little angle theta. Okay? And uh, it would be the way bow and arrows work if you draw back on a string. As long as the arrow uh, is, a, or the string is allowed to slide in the notch on the arrow, you're always going to get a nice symmetrical pattern here. You're not going to have some weird angle at the top that's different from the bottom. The only way you could do that is if somehow the string were to either get caught or was tied or, or had to uh, be, be stuck to the arrow. So the arrow and the string are free sliding, which means that they're going to slide into an equilibrium position. And in fact, we'll see in a minute one of the things that contributes to that. Let's write expressions for the sides of these new blue triangles. Well, uh, Ft, whatever that is, times the sine of angle theta is what the value of this side is going to be. And it's also going to be the same here. And then uh, there's not enough room, so I'll write them over here. But we can see that what we have here are two blue horizontal arrows, which would be calculated as Ft cos theta. And since there are two of them, I'll just put two out front to remind us that those are the horizontal forces. OK, so we've resolved our vectors. Let's look at the vertical forces. If we look at the vertical forces, we can see there are only two vertical arrows. There is the Ft sine theta, that's here, and the Ft sine theta there. Now, in order for the arrow to be in equilibrium and not be moving or accelerating, right? Um, which is what happens when you draw back a bowstring and you hold it there. Nothing is accelerating, so all of our net forces are going to have to be zero, our x and our y. So here we see two forces that look like they are the same amounts, and they are operating in opposite directions. So they will effectively, I guess we could say, cancel each other out. If we wanted to write our f net y equation, just to check things out, we would see that what we have is an Ft sine theta that's going upwards and an Ft sine theta going downwards, so the minus for down. And of course, since F net is ma, we end up with ma equals zero, but we expect that because we expect that the acceleration will be zero anyway if the bowstring is being held constant, right? And all this is telling us is that, yeah, you're right. Zero equals zero, and the forces are canceling out. So we can kind of infer that by looking at the question, which means the y 
forces are not having any major effect on anything that's happening. And that's also why, since these two forces are equal, why you're going to get a nice symmetrical triangle. But anyway, let's move on to the X forces. Okay? In fact, I'll just erase this stuff here because it's not really telling us anything except what we already knew, that there's going to be no acceleration in the vertical direction. In fact, we know that ahead of time. Now let's do the F net X forces. F net X, all of the forces in the X direction, what I see are an F applied, and I see that there are two Ft cos thetas. And those are the only forces that are operating horizontally. Okay, let's uh, see if there's something else we can do with this. Because the bow and arrow is being pulled and held, it's in steady, constant state, there's no acceleration then I can assume that because F net is MA, the A will be zero and will make the F net zero. Which leaves me with this, which is just copied from above. Now at first, it looks like there's not much I can do with this, but if I go back to my original question, there's a very important hint or, or relationship in there. And what it says is that the arrow is pulled back until the tension in the bowstring becomes equal to the applied force. If we write that in a mathematical statement, that simply means that the tension in the bowstring, Ft, is equal to the applied force, which means I can make a substitution in my little expression that I have written. Instead of F applied, I can write Ft because they are equal. And so, I do a little substitution, and I get this cute little thing. And now what I can do is I can just perform some algebra. First of all, I can see that... Uh, oh, I should also no point out one other thing that I, I've neglected to point out now that I realize it. Notice our F applied here on this side of the picture. Notice the direction in which it is pointed. I made a... Uh, an oversight here, and I forgot to imply that this force is in the opposite direction, and so we would need to have a negative sign in front of it. So I'll fix that before I go any further. Apologize for that. Let's move that to force to the other side so we get this. Now it becomes a positive force on the other side. So basically what we're saying is uh, that the magnitude of these two forces are equal. Okay? That's another way you can look at it. Well, why don't I divide both sides of this equation by Ft? Since it appears on both sides. And then if I do that, I'll just slide over here and finish this up. What I would get then is 1. Ft divided by Ft is 1. It's not 0 like some students think. A lot of students look at this and they think, oh, uh, I'll cancel out. Let me show you what they do. I'm going to erase what I wrote here. This is an important algebra lesson for beginning algebra students. They say, oh, the FTs cancel. And then they, they think that if it cancels, it's nothing left over here and it's zero. And that's why I hate to use the word cancel. Nothing cancels in math. We perform algebraic operations, which are, in this case, dividing both sides by FT. So what that effectively does is it makes the FT itself disappear. So that's where we get the word cancel. But really what it does is it turns them all into ones. FT over FT is one, and FT over FT is one. So one equals two, and then times one, but we don't show it. And so that's how it, that's how it appears. So be careful of the word cancel. Then if we divide both sides by two, we get a half equals cos theta. And if any of you are aware of your special angles, uh, take 0 0.5, put it into your calculator, and do the inverse cosine of 0 0.5, right? Cos negative 1, or the arc cos, if you're as old as I am. And that will give you the angle theta. And you will find that that will equal 60 degrees. So suddenly, we have a number. Even though back in our equations, we never had any numbers, so to speak. 
uh, except what we did have were proportions and relationships. We knew that F applied equals FT right here, and we knew uh, about this little two. And we pulled those out of the question, and we got an angle for theta of 60 degrees. Going back to our picture then, that means there's a 60 degree angle right here, and likewise a 60 degree angle right here, which means that the angle between the bowstrings that we originally wanted must be 120 degrees. And so we can use an equation that has no numbers in it, or few numbers, no given numbers, that's for sure, and we can still come up with something quite meaningful and useful. If we learn to use algebra, as we did over here, and we learn to manipulate expressions, not being too concerned about what the numbers might be. And so that's the way you solve the uh, question, the bow and arrow question. That's a great question to study.